Hi, my name is Jamie Xell, and in this talk I'm going to present an alternative attenuation formulation for point bytes that does not have the singularity problems of the inverse square attenuation function, which makes the light intensities go to infinity as you get closer and closer to a light source. Well, I find this formulation rather practical, and I just wanted to share it with the computer graphics world. I hope that you're going to find it practical as well. Well, point lights are not the most realistic light sources we have in computer graphics. Nonetheless, they're still relatively popular because of their simplicity, I think. If you're okay with having more complicated light sources, there are definitely more realistic alternatives to point lights. But if you want to go with something simple, point lights become relatively attractive. Putting aside any concerns about the realism of the point light sources, the practical problem they have is their attenuation behavior. So for, for any light source, as you move away from the light source, the light you receive at a unit area becomes less and less, right? So this is a light attenuation. And of course, the same goes for point light sources. If the distance between the light receiving surface and the point light is d, then the attenuation function for point lights will be 1 over d squared. That's the inverse squared attenuation function I just mentioned. And there's nothing theoretically wrong about this attenuation function. This is the correct attenuation function for a point light. But there's a practical problem, that is, when the distance d goes to 0, this attenuation function goes to infinity. And infinity is not something that we want to deal with in our renders. Not, we don't even want to deal with large numbers. So this has been around for quite some time, of course, and people came up with all sorts of solutions. Uh, here are some of them. For example, one solution is that we don't put anything close to a light source. Right? So, I mean, it could be doable in some cases, but what is really close to a light source is? It kind of depends on the scale of the scene, right? So what's the limit of closeness? It's sort of not very well defined. Also, in some cases, we can't quite do that. Um, for example, for virtual point lights, we need to put them on top of surfaces, right? So they're going to be, by definition, close to the surfaces. Okay, we, if you can't do that, can we just at least limit the distance value we use for computing the attenuation function? Well, we can do that, but then again, what is that limit? It's sort of not very well defined. Uh, if you can't limit that, can we limit the maximum elimination we get from the light source? Uh, again, we run into a similar problem here. It, you know, it's, it's the same thing as just defining the, a, a limit for the distance. And well, what is that going to be? It's sort of unclear. A common solution to that is just modifying the attenuation function. But, but then we know that the inverse square attenuation is the correct attenuation function for a point light, so whatever else we're going to do is going to be incorrect. So how do we do that? Well, this is exactly actually what we're going to do in this talk as well. But the way we're going to do that is that we're going to modify the light source. Because the problem is not the attenuation function itself, per se, but the fact that we have a light source that has no size and emitting some, some light. And that's where the problem is. So we're going to solve this problem by looking at the light source and modifying it slightly. But just, just slightly. So here's our modified light source. I, I marked it as this, this asterisk here, point light source. Uh, so our modified light source is going to have an additional parameter that is going to be the radius parameter. If I have a radius parameter of a light source, turns out I might be able to get around the limitations of the inverse square attenuation function. Um, and I'm going to say that, yeah, this is adding some additional complexity to, to a point light source definition, but this is not much complexity, right? It's just a little bit. And, and the thing is, a lot of times when we're dealing with point lights, we actually want to, we're actually trying to represent something that already exists. So if I want to put a point light that, that that's trying to approximate an existing light source, and I might have a pretty good idea about what the size of that point light is supposed to be. So right, this is a relatively intuitive parameter to set. Still, I'm pretty sure some people are going to complain about this and say, hey, you're just adding additional complexity. Well, I'm going to, let, let me show you something. For example, if you look at Blender, the way that Blender deals with point lights, you see that we have this inverse square attenuation option here that's called fall off. Uh, but it also accompanied by two parameters right below that, the distance and the sphere. So if you're familiar with Blender, maybe you know what those parameters mean, but if you're not, maybe maybe you can guess what those parameters mean, maybe, maybe not. But the thing is, there are some additional parameters that you're going to have to deal with to get around the limitations of the inverse square attenuation function. 
Here's another example. This is, in this case, we're showing 3ds Max, uh, which has quite a few parameters controlling the line attenuation. Of course, these serve a lot of purposes, but one of the purposes they serve is to get around the singularity of the inverse square attenuation function, right? So, considering those, I would say just adding one radius parameter is not that big a deal. All right, so let's say we're adding this radius parameter. It's, let's say r is our radius. If r is zero, we know that this inverse square attenuation function is the correct attenuation function. But what if r is not zero? What if r is something that's greater than zero? So that's what we're going to find out. So here, I'm going to derive the equation for this slightly modified point light and its attenuation function. And it's going to be a little bit mathy. Um, and if you're familiar with rendering related math, it's going to be super easy. If not, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll actually help you walk through it. All right. So we're going to start with the rendering equation. Here's what the rendering equation defines. This, here's the setup. We have some light coming to a surface, and we're going to see the reflected light off of that surface, and we're shading that surface, right? So the reflected light, that's the outgoing light off of that surface, is going to be equal to this integral over the entire uh, possible directions over hemisphere, the entire hemisphere. And for any direction, for any direction where some light is coming from, we multiply this incoming light with the geometry term, and then with the surface DRDF that's defined these material properties. And that's how we get the outgoing light. All right. So this is a general equation that actually works for pretty much anything. But for a point light, if we just have a point light, this equation simplifies quite a bit because we have only one direction where the light is coming from. So this, this integral collapses into this relatively simpler form. All right. So here, what is the incoming light? The incoming light can be written as the intensity of the light source, the point light source, multiplied by the visibility, that is the, just the shadow factor, and our attenuation formulation, whatever that would be. All right. So what we're going to do here to drive the attenuation formulation is that we're going to start with the point lights, with our modified point light, and with the rendering equation. And we're going to simplify it to a form that looks very much like these two equations below here. And we're going to have all of these terms, like the light intensity, the, the visibility, the DRDF, and the geometry term. And the rest of the equation, what we're going to be left with, is going to be associated with our attenuation function. Right? So that's the process that we're going to follow. All right, let's begin. Here's our rendering equation, and we have this point light source. The first thing we're going to do is that we're going to replace that point light source with a light source that has some radius, right? So that basically turns our light source into a spherical light. But because it's a spherical light, light is not coming from one direction anymore. It's actually coming from a range of directions, so we can't immediately collapse it into group. So let's do this step by step. First thing first, we're taking this point light and converting to a spherical light, right? What's the corresponding spherical light of a point light? Well, to find that, we're going to make sure that these two light sources emit the same total radiant power, right? So for, for a point light source, this is relatively simple. The radiant power for a point light source turns out to be 4 pi i, i being the intensity of the light source, and 4 pi comes from the, the surface area of the unit sphere. All right. For a spherical light, this is slightly more complicated. Uh, any point on this spherical light is going to be emitting some illumination in all directions over a hemisphere. Here, we're going to assume that this is a Lambertian emitter. This is a very, actually, very typical uh, assumption here. Most of the light sources in computer graphics that we use are Lambertian emitters. So for a Lambertian emitter, the light intensity is going to be proportional to the cosine of the direction. So if the, the radiance is L, then the total emission from the point is going to be pi L, pi being the cosine weighted area of the hemisphere. All right, so if you integrate this over the entire surface of the spherical light, we're going to get the final radiant power. That's going to be this term. So we would like these two terms to be equal to each other, right? So this allows us to define what L is supposed to be in given the intensity of a point light. Very good. And if I know what L is, I can write the incoming light. And the incoming radius is going to be this term multiplied by the visibility term. So if the light is visible, I'm going to have this incoming radius. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have zero. Simple enough. All right. Let's put this inside our rendering equation. And then our rendering equation takes this form. 
Right. So far, all we did was we took our light source and we converted it to a spherical light, nothing else. All right. Let's start simplifying this equation just a little bit. First simplifying assumption is that for the purposes of computing the BRDF and the geometry term, we're going to treat this light source as a point light. Now that's a reasonable thing to do because hey, we're interested in point lights, so I guess it's okay. Uh, so and if we do that, then we can easily take these two terms outside of the, inter the integral, uh, and this is what we're left with. So in this case, all we have left inside the integral is the visibility term. Pretty good. Now this is great because the visibility function is a very, very simple function. The visibility function is, is one for all angles that are within this, uh, w uh, the solid angle where the light source is visible. For all other angles, it's going to be zero. So basically, this, this integral means that the area of the solid angle that corresponds to the visible part uh, where the light source is visible. Now, this is quite simple to compute. There's an analytical solution to that, uh, especially if the entire solid angle is contained within the hemisphere. But in some cases, it may not be contained inside the hemisphere, or that's going to be a little bit of a problem. We can still come up with a closed form solution for that, but that's going to be a bit more complicated, and I would like to avoid that extra complexity. So I'm going to just ignore that case. I'm going to say that let's assume that the solid angle is completely contained uh, over the hemisphere. If that is the case, then I can write a closed form solution to this integral. That's going to be 2 pi 1 minus cosine alpha, alpha being the angle that determines the size of that, size of that solid angle. Very good. And the remaining term here, uh, the remaining visibility term here on the right hand side, corresponds to the point light shadow. All right, we're almost done here. Now we have the visibility term, we have the light intensity, we have the BRDF, we have the geometry term. And everything that is left should be our attenuation function, right? So let's write it out. This is our attenuation function. Very well. All right. So we can actually compute this fairly easily. The only difficulty here is computing this cosine alpha. Actually, we can compute cosine alpha fairly easily using a spherical light. But the problem is that the, the, this angle alpha is defined only for distances that are greater than the light radius r. Because if we get inside the light source, then this, this angle becomes undefined. So we can't quite do that. Hmm. To get around this, we're going to introduce another assumption here. We're going to treat this, treat our light source as a disk light instead of a spherical light that is, that is aligned with the primary point light direction. And when we do that, we get this simple triangle here, and using Pythagoras' theorem, we can easily say what the cosine alpha is supposed to be. And putting that into our equation gets our final equation of light attenuation, or point light attenuation. All right, so let's take a look at this, at this equation just a little bit. Here, as you can see, if r is greater than zero, when the distance d is zero, this is not going to go to infinity, right? This is going to go to a finite value, which is, which is good, which is what we wanted. Another interesting thing here is that when r is zero, this function actually goes to this inverse square attenuation function. It's one over d squared. Well, this is not quite obvious from this, this notation up here, but, but believe me when I tell you this actually goes to one over d squared. And this perfectly makes sense because all of the assumptions we made for deriving this attenuation function are perfectly valid for point lights when r is equal to zero. So in a way, we ended up deriving this inverse square attenuation function. So let's see what this equation looks like in comparison to inverse square attenuation. So here's a graph showing the inverse square attenuation at the very top to our, our attenuation function with different uh, radius parameters. Uh, so as you can see, when the distance is zero, the inverse square attenuation function goes to infinity, and our attenuation function go converges to some finite value based on what uh, the radius value you pick. But for larger distances, all of these attenuation functions converge to the same result. So here's uh, another way of looking at the similar data using a log-log plot. Again, for larger distances, they all converge to the same value. But as you get closer and closer to the light source, they converge to different values. Here's a visual comparison. 
In this case, we're using virtual point lights, actually 100,000 virtual point lights in the scene, uh, computed using the inverse square attenuation function. In this image, some bright spots are visible, so you can pretty much tell where some of the virtual point lights are. And we can get rid of them by switching to our attenuation function. In this case, there are all of those bright spots are gone. Uh, and this is just accomplished by using our attenuation function. For computing the radius of each virtual point light here, we use the virtual spherical light formulation. But actually what we're doing is a little bit simpler than virtual spherical lights. We're just using virtual point lights with our attenuation function. And that, that's about it. Before I finish, I'd like to talk about a common ad hoc solution to the inverse square attenuation function. So, so for the inverse square attenuation function, one solution to get rid of this singularity is just to add a constant term to the denominator here. And this totally works. You get rid of the, the singularity. The problem here is that it's unclear what to use as this constant value, right? So maybe our attenuation function can help. So if you would like, if we would like these two attenuation functions to converge to the same value when distance is zero, we can easily do so. We can just set the distance to zero with our attenuation function and get what constant that constant value is. And to be able to reach that constant value, we just need to set the constant c as r squared over two. So this kind of gives a relatively convenient way of intuitively setting what that constant is supposed to be. Uh, of course, comparing these two attenuation functions, I have some understanding of what the attenuation function we derive means, but the, the one about is just some ad hoc modification, so I actually have no idea what it means. But if you want to see what it looks like on the graphs, here's a comparison of our attenuation function to this ad hoc modification. They, of course, they converge to the same value when distance is zero, Away from that, they behave slightly differently. Of course, as you move away from the light source with larger and larger distances, everything converges. Uh, all of these functions converge to the same, same value. So in conclusion, I've just described an alternative attenuation function for point lights. And this attenuation function avoids the singularity of the typical inverse square attenuation function. And we achieve this just by adding a relatively intuitive parameter that's the radius of a light source. So one obvious question at this point is, can this approximate spherical lights, right? Because we just added a radius parameter to a point light, then it just become a, a spherical light source. Um, well, not, not quite. Yeah, maybe some approximation, but it's not going to be a close approximation. And there's a good reason for that. And the reason is hidden at this, this step. Remember this function? Uh, so here we have a spherical light that corresponds to a point light source. And what we did here at this step was that we looked at the BRDF and the geometry term, and we said we're going to evaluate those by assuming that our light source is a point light. By doing so, we sort of lost any hope of closely approximating a spherical light. So if you want to closely approximate a spherical light, we need to handle this step a bit more carefully. But because we treated this as a point light source, this is not going to give us a very close approximation to a spherical light necessarily. But it's a pretty good point light if you ask me. So with that, I would like to thank Pete Shirley for his helpful comments, and my student Ian Mallet for his help with explaining some of the derivations, and anonymous reviewers for their helpful comments. And of course, thank you for watching.